Lucifer's Fall and Antichrist Rise, Part 1. Hello and welcome to Just Thoughts, Short Studies. I have been asked to do some short studies for those who do not have time to sit down and listen to the full studies on my channel. So with that in mind, I'm going to be brief, and I'm going to be doing a series of short studies beginning with this one. And let us begin by turning to Ezekiel chapter 28 in the Old Testament. Our goal here being to prove who the Antichrist is. The Bible makes it very clear so that when we are done with this series, you should have no doubt as to what our Father's Word says about the identity of the Antichrist and what he shall do when he comes. Before we begin this, as you should always do when you're studying our Father's Word, let us go before our Father in prayer and ask for wisdom and guidance and understanding. So let us pray as you're turning to Ezekiel chapter 28. Our glorious Heavenly Father, we come before you this day, Father, to ask for wisdom, for guidance, and for understanding as we search out these scriptures in your word. We ask that you open eyes and ears and hearts and minds to be able to receive these truths and see the deeper meanings, Father. We ask that your hands always be upon these studies to guide us and lead us to the truth, into the light, Father. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Amen. So, Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 1. You're going to probably be a little bit surprised here, but Ezekiel 28 is covering who the Antichrist is. So, Ezekiel 28 chapter verse, or chapter 1, or chapter 28 verse 1. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, in other words, it came to Ezekiel, verse 2, Son of man, that means son of man, man in the flesh, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Tyrus meaning rock, in this case the false rock, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, in other words, because you're prideful, and thou hast said, I am God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God. Though thou set thy heart as the heart of God. Now we're going to understand this word man a little greater in detail as we go on. It's simply a reference meaning he is male of gender. It doesn't necessarily mean a human being in the flesh. Historically maybe, but we're talking about Antichrist in the prophetical here. Verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret they can hide from thee. In other words, Satan is very wise. He's stupid, but he's wise. He's very cunning. Verse 4. With thy wisdom and thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches. Thou hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. In other words, Satan's very wealthy, uh, even as his children are the sons of Cain. We'll go into that in another study at another time. Verse 5. By thy great wisdom and thy traffic, that means his speech, Hast thou increased thy riches, because thine heart is lifted up, because of thy riches? Verse 6. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, in other words, he wants to be God. Verse 7. Behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of nations. Uh, the terrible here means the uh, formidable. In other words, it's talking about the elect. God's going to bring the elect upon the Antichrist when he comes. And they will draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom. In other words, they're, they're going to bring out the truth against Satan's wisdom that he's using to deceive the world. They shall defy thy, defile thy brightness. The sword that they swing is the sword of Revelation chapter 116. It's Christ's tongue. It's the word of God, quite frankly. Verse 8. They shall bring thee down to the pit. And thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. In other words, as those that die in the flood. In other words, in this case, the flood of lies and deception. Satan is even deceiving himself, thinking that he can overcome God. Verse 9. Will thou say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Who is it that slays Satan? Well, quite frankly, it's God. It's our Lord. Verse 10. 
Thou shalt die the death of the uncircumcised. Uncircumcised here is a word usually associated with the uh, Gentiles, but it means the unlearned. In other words, you're going to die the death of the unlearned. Satan, though he is brilliant and cunning, is ignorant to the truth that uh, of his place. In other words, he has tried to overthrow God. A lot of people don't even realize when that happened. It was in the first earth age, and like I said, we'll go into that probably in another lecture too. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hands of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Verse 11. Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation, that means a, a mournful song, a funeral song, upon the king of Tyrus. In other words, this would be Satan before he was Satan. This is when he was Lucifer. And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. In other words, this is Satan's description. Satan is not some red animal with uh, goat's legs and a pointed tail and horns. Like most people have portrayed him over the years, he's a very beautiful archangel. And just because he has become evil, his countenance has not changed. He still is a beautiful archangel, though he is evil in his heart. Verse 13. Thou hast also been in, the e in Eden, the garden of God. In other words, we're referring here to the book of Genesis. Um, Satan was there in the garden of God as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because he has known good and evil, once being loose for the good and now knowing evil, and also as the serpent. Serpent being a uh, term that means degradation. It's not an actual serpent. The word is nakash, which does mean snake, but it's a state of degradation. To continue with the verse. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. In other words, God didn't create Satan evil. But he did give him free will, as all of us have free will, and Satan chose to rebel against God. This will let you know who he is, right here, verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. In other words, Satan was once that beautiful archangel that was a protecting cherubim until he fell. Verse 15, and here we go. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. This is when Satan became Satan. In other words, he changed from being Lucifer, the bright star, the morning star, into Satan, which means the adversary. And it happened, quite frankly, in the first earth age at the overthrow, which is called the Catabol in Hebrew. This is when Satan became evil and he attempted to overthrow God. A lot of people know that Satan is evil, but they don't know when this happened. Well, it's written. 2 Peter chapter 3, it's various places. Jeremiah chapter 4, it was the overthrow. It's when God destroyed the earth age that was. There are three earth ages spoken of. Verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled, thee with the midst of, uh, uh, filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned. In other words, Satan became prideful because of all of his merchandise and all of his treasures and his own brightness. And uh, he was filled with violence. In other words, he rebelled against God. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. In other words, you, you think you're all that in a bag of chips because of your beauty and your brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, which is to say the earth. I will lay thee before kings, that they may thee behold thee. Verse 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, in other words, by his speech. Therefore I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. 
That, of course, is going to be the death of Satan. But that is futuristic to the events that are still yet to come. In other words, him appearing, claiming to be Christ's return, which is the basis for the word antichrist, which means in place of Christ, instead of Christ. Verse 19. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shall thou be any more. In other words, when they see him destroyed, it is going to be a terror, and he's not going to exist anymore. He's going to be blotted out. Verse 20. Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, verse 2, or excuse me, verse 21. Son of man, set thy face against Zidon, and prophesy against it. Tyre and Zidon are references to the Ire, or the island just off the coast of Israel, which was a place of merchandise. This is talking to uh, the king of Tyre's kingdom, Zidon. And quite frankly, it has to do with those sons of Cain. Again, a, another study for another time. Um, the sin in the garden was not that Adam and Eve had sex. It was that Adam, Eve, and Satan all partook in a sexual act, which brought forth Cain. We'll have to prove this in another study as we're short on time here, but we're going to go through that in another time and place. Verse 22. And say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, O Zidon. I will be glorified in the midst of thee, and they shall know that I am the Lord, when I have executed judgments in her, and shall be sanctified in her. In other words, even the Kenites are going to come to the realization of who the true God is, the true Christ. Verse 23. For I will send into her pestilence, and blood into her streets, and the wounded shall be judged in the midst of her by the sword upon every side, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 24. And there shall be no more pricking briar in the house of Israel, nor any grieving thorn. Again, uh, I've made mention of this in my longer studies. Briars and thorns are symbolic of the sons of Cain. Thorn in your side, you might say. The analogy is, is that they come in and um, they keep people from getting to the word of God. They are as a wall of briars or thorns. Uh, to continue with the verse. Of all round about them that despise them, they shall know that I am the Lord. In other words, that's, that's going to happen on the day of the Lord. Verse 25. Thus saith the Lord God, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered, and shall be sanctified them in the sight of the heathen, then they shall dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. Jacob, of course, being Israel, and we're talking about the nation of Israel here. We're not necessarily talking about the gathering back that happened in 1948. We're talking about the day of the Lord, which is the beginning of the millennium, that thousand-year period, when Christ himself shall teach. And who's he going to teach? Those who have not come to the truth that are worthy. In other words, because of their ignorance. Verse 26. And they shall dwell safely therein, and they shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgments upon all that despise them round about, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. We know that this is not the case this day because the Jews do not believe in Christ. And also, they don't dwell safely. Look at all the bombings and stuff that are going over there. But let's move on now to Isaiah chapter 3. Or, or excuse me, Isaiah chapter 14. We're going to begin at verse 3. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 3. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow, and from thy fear, and from thy hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. In other words... Historically, we would be talking about when they were freed from bondage. Prophetically, we're talking about when he gives us rest. What is our rest? It's Christ. Christ was sacrificed on the Sabbath. Sabbath meaning rest. In other words, this is talking about the day of the Lord. Verse 4. That thou shalt take up this proverb, or saying, against the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon is a historical figure, which was Nebuchadnezzar. But the king of Babylon of the end times will be Satan the Antichrist. Babylon meaning confusion. The king of confusion. Satan is the king of confusion because he confuses people into believing that he is Christ. You shall take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased and the golden city ceased? What golden city? Mystery Babylon. 
Verse 5. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked, and the scepter of the rulers. In other words, the rulers that ruled underneath the wicked one. Verse 6. And he smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He ruled in the nations in anger, is persecuted. In other words, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted, and none hindereth. In other words, none can stop it. Who is this one that ruled in wrath in a continual stroke and ruled over the nations? Well, that's Satan, the Antichrist, ruling over the world. Verse 7. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing, in other words, on the day of the Lord. Verse 8. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, symbolic of the elect in Israel, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. Verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. It is stirred up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. In other words, all who, those who thought they were something in the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. In other words, all those that were in bed with the Antichrist worshiping him. We'll cover a little bit more in subsequent studies about this. Verse 10. All they that speak and say unto thee, Art thou become weak as we? Or, or excuse me, they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou become as weak as we? Or, Art thou become likened unto us? In other words, they're going to look at their king, which they thought was Jesus Christ, and see that he's nothing more than Satan, a fallen archangel, and that now he's made powerless by God. And they're going to say, Are you become as weak as we are? Verse 11. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How do we know who we're talking about here? Well, here we go. Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, that is the earth, which did weaken the nations? How? Through deception. He deceives the whole world. The word Lucifer here is H1966, Halel, from H1984, which means, in the sense of brightness, the morning star, Lucifer. Verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the throne on the mount of the congregation. In other words, that's Mount Zion. That's God's favorite place on earth. That's the place where his throne was, in the sides of the north. Verse 14. I will, send, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. In other words, I will be like God. I'm going to come back claiming to be God. We're talking about the Antichrist here. Satan, Lucifer. Verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. And they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the nation, or the, the earth to tremble, and did shake the nations? In other words, shake them and make them confused. Again, the word man here is subjective. It means male of gender. The Antichrist is not a flesh man and never will be. And we'll make that clear either in this or in subsequent lectures. Verse 17, that made the world as a wilderness, that means a desolation. If you've read Daniel chapter 8 and 9, that should be clear to you. And destroyed the cities thereof, and opened not the house of his prisoners. In other words, he kept them captive. Captive in what? Deception. Made them think he was Christ. Verse 18, all the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, everyone in his own house. In other words, they all fell and worshipped this Antichrist. It was only the elect that did not. Verse 19. But thou art cast out of the grave like an abominable branch. You know, Christ is the true branch. This is an abominable branch. And as the raiment of those that are slain thrust through with the sword, that go down to the stones of the pit, and as a carcass trodden under feet. Carcass, of course, meaning a dead thing. <clears throat> and what happens to raiment when it's thrust through the sword? Well, it becomes crimson red with blood. They're slain. And we're talking about more than the flesh here. Satan is the destroyer of souls. Those that believe on him, anyway. Verse 20. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land, and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. So in other words, the seed of evildoers shall never be remembered. We've got a 
play on the children of Cain here. Verse 21. Prepare slaughter for his children and for the iniquity of their fathers. For they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. Why? They're destroyed. Verse 22. For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name, and the remnant, and the son, and the nephew, saith the Lord. In other words, all of those that fell to the king of Babylon. Babylon, again, meaning confusion. Now let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to get Paul's understanding about what, who the Antichrist is. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, a letter of Paul, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, I mean fellow Christians, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. In other words, that's your subject. This is how we're going to gather back to Christ. Verse 2. That you be not soon shaken, that means confused in mind, or be troubled, neither in spirit, nor by word, in other words, those who teach you the word, but teach wrongly, nor as by letter as from us. In other words, Paul's first letter where people mistook it to mean a different thing. As the day of Christ is at hand, verse 2, let no man deceive you by any means. That includes that man of sin. For that day, what day? The day of the Lord, the day that Christ returns, shall not come except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of position. The word falling away here is the word uh, apostasy, apostasia, which means to be duped, out of your beliefs, or fooled out of your beliefs, or to change your beliefs. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, there is only one entity in the Bible that has been judged so far. And we read of it in Ezekiel 28, Thou shalt be brought to ashes. It's talking about Satan. The son of perdition is Satan. He is one of God's children. He was created by God. But he is the son of perdition because he is the son who is going to perish. You can check this out by looking it up for yourself. And how do we know this is Satan? Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. But he's not God, he's Satan. Christ's remembered body of Christians are the temple of God prophetically. But this also has to do with the temple which shall be established in Jerusalem where the false Christ shall return. In other words, Antichrist coming, claiming to be Christ, Satan. Verse 5. Remember ye not when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Verse 6. And now you know what withheldeth that it might, he might be revealed in his time. In other words, Satan's going to be revealed in his time. Going to be revealed for who he is. And what is meant here by what withholdeth, now you know what we're waiting on. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. This, of course, is referring to Mark, uh, Michael, the archangel, who holds Satan bound in chains. When he's taken out of the way and Satan is cast to the earth, then this event happens, the Antichrist coming. Verse 6. And then shall that wicked be revealed, who the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. That's that two-edged sword, Revelation 1.16, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. In other words, he's going to destroy the brightness of the Antichrist by the coming of the true Christ, by his coming. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders. Why is his power after Satan? Because he is Satan. This is just a metaphoric way of speech in the Greek, translated into English. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. Didn't want to study their father's word. One of the easy way out. We want to rapture way, brother, that they might be saved. Verse 11. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. What lie? that there's going to be a rapture, that Satan is Christ. Verse 12, that they might all be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, they took pleasure in it, made lots of money in their churches, put on fake healing shows. Verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks always to, 
to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning, that's that same catabole, the overthrow, chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15. <clears throat> Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions whether you have been taught by word or our epistle. Verse 16. In other words, hold fast to the truth. Don't fall off to false doctrines of men which make void the word of God. Verse 16. Now our Lord and Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us an everlasting consolation, in other words, eternal life, and good hope through grace, that being the grace of Christ, verse 17. Comfort your hearts and establish, or he establish you, in every good work. And that's what you want to do, friend, is be in good works. You need to study to show yourself approved. You don't want to be caught in the famine of the end times as written in Amos chapter 8. Now remember always to go into the Greek and Hebrew when you're studying our Father's Word. Use the tools that God has provided for us, the Strong's Concordance, the Green's Interlinear, the Smith's Bible Dictionary. If you can, obtain an E.W. Bullard's or Companion Bible. It's very helpful. At any rate, that's where we're going to end this Bible study for this particular time. So this study can remain short. But beautiful brothers and sisters in Christ, always study to show yourself approved. And first and foremost, ask our Father for wisdom and guidance and the light of the truth when you do study. And always remember to pray for those that walk in darkness, for they are the ones that need it the most. May God bless you in your studies. Thank you for listening, and this has been Just Thoughts.